Okay, I already uh, indicated on the first day that you will be in for some torture tonight, the day, because you have to listen to a, len a lengthy presentation. Uh, and from my own experience as a uh, member of audiences, I know that I always hated it when they are speaking for such a long time. But you have to endure it, otherwise uh, there will be anathema. <laughs> um, so it is no secret that I'm not a Hayekian. Still, I consider Hayek a great economist, not in the same league as Mises, but few, if any, economists are in the same league. Um, Hayek's fame in the public mind, however, has less to do with his economic writings, but stems largely from his writings in political theory. And it is in this area where I consider Hayek as mostly deficient. Not even his system of definitions in this area is internally consistent. His excursions into the field of epistemology, I consider to be much better, quite ingenious. But even there, he falls short of the achievements of his teacher, Ludwig von Mises. Nonetheless, owing to his wide-ranging interdisciplinary oeuvre um, and the interdisciplinary nature of it, uh, which contains uh, a treasure trove of keen insights into many issues, I consider Hayek one of the second 20th century outstanding intellectuals writing in the area of the social sciences. That we might console the Hayekians a little bit. Um, as a reflection of this esteem, Hayek was also quoted in the programmatic statement of the PFS, and I quote, we must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. What we lack is a liberal utopia, a program which seems neither a mere defense of things as they are, um, nor a, and nor, nor a diluted kind of socialism, but a truly liberal radicalism which does not spare the susceptibilities of the mighty, which is not too severely practical, and which does not confine itself to what appears today as political possible. We need intellectual leaders who are prepared to resist the blandishments of power and influence, and who are willing to work for an ideal, however small may be the prospects of its early realization. They must be men who are willing to stick to principles and to fight for their full realization, however remote. Unless we can make the philosophical foundations of a free society once more a living intellectual issue and its implementation a task which challenges the ingenuity and imagination of our liveliest minds, the prospects of freedom are indeed dark. But if we can regain that belief in the power of ideas, which was the mark of liberalism at its best, the battle is not lost. Now, Hayek, of course, did not follow his own advice, but ended up in his political philosophy with a mishmash full of internally inconsistent compromises. Yet this does not mean that his plea for an uncompromising intellectual radicalism, which has been the purpose and become the hallmark of the PFS, is not worthwhile or correct. But this shall not be my topic here. Rather, I want to speak about another important, if you will, 
complementary insight of Hayek's that can be found in the introduction he wrote for the collection of essays gathered in the book Capitalism and the Historians. Here, Hayek makes the point that while uncompromising intellectual radicalism is necessary as a source of energy and inspiration for the leaders of a liberal libertarian movement, this is not sufficient to make for public appeal because the general public is not used, used to or incapable of abstract reasoning, high theory and intellectual consistency, but forms its political views and convictions on the basis of historical narratives, that is, of prevailing interpretations of past events. And hence, it is upon those who want to change things for a better, liberal, libertarian future to challenge and correct such interpretations and, perp and propose and promote alternative revisionist historical narratives. Let me quote Hayek to this effect. Quote, while the events of the past are the source of the experience of the human race, their opinions are determined not by objective facts, but by the records and interpretations to which they have access. Historical myths have perhaps played nearly a great, as great a role in shaping opinion as historical facts. The influence which the writers of history thus exercise on public opinion is probably more immediate and extensive than that of political theorists who launch new ideas. It seems as though even such new ideas reach wider circles, usually not in their abstract form, um, but as the interpretations of particular events. The historian is in this respect at least one step closer to the general public um, and has more direct power over public opinion than the theorist. Most people, when being told that their political convictions have been affected by particular views of economic history, will answer that they have never read and been interested in economic theory at all. They have never read a history, economic history book. Um, nonetheless, um, even if they have never read a book on the subject, this does not mean that they do not, with all the rest of the people, regard as established facts many of the legends which at one time or another have been given currency by writers on economic history. The central theme of the mentioned book, edited by Hayek, is the revision of the still popular myth that it was the system of free market capitalism at the time of the beginning of the so-called Industrial Revolution around 1800, which has been responsible for the economic misery that caused even little children having to work for 16 hours or more under atrocious conditions in mines or similarly uncomfortable work conditions. And that it was only due to the pressure of labor unions and government intervention into the economy by so-called social policy means and measures that this inhumane system of capitalist exploitation was gradually overcome and improved. Now, when we first hear this sad story, one would think that the immediate question coming to mind should be, why would any parent subject his child to such a treatment and hand it over to some 
evil capitalist exploiter. Did these people have a jolly good time before strolling around in meadows and fields, healthy and with red cheeks, picking flowers, eating apples from apple trees, fishing and swimming in creeks, rivers, and lakes, playing with their toys and attentively listening to their grandparents' tales. In that case, what horrible people must these parents have been? Merely asking this question should be sufficient to realize that this story cannot be true. And in fact, as Hayek and his collaborators demonstrated, it is just about the opposite of the truth. Until the Industrial Revolution, England and the rest of the world for thousands of years had lived under Malthusian conditions. That is, the supply of consumer goods provided either by nature or by human production through means of production um, um, was not sufficient to ensure the survival of a growing population. Population growth exceeded the growth of production and any increases in productivity and hence not only in England but everywhere an excess of population regularly had to die off due to malnutrition, ill health and ultimately starvation. It was only with, this, with and since the Industrial Revolution that this situation fundamentally changed and the Malthusian trap was successfully overcome. First in England, then in continental Europe and the European overseas dependencies, and finally to a large extent also in the rest of the world, so as to allow not only for a steadily growing population, but an increasing population with continuously rising material standards of living. And this momentous achievement was a result of free market capitalism, or more precisely, a combination and interplay of three factors. First, the general security of private property. Second, the low time preference, that is, the ability and willingness of a growing number of people to delay immediate gratification, um, uh, that is a low, low time preference, the ability and willingness of a growing number of people to delay gratification so as to save for the future and accumulate an ever larger stock of capital goods. And third, the intelligence and ingenuity of a sufficient number of people to invent and engineer a steady stream of ever new productivity enhancing tools and machines. The parents of the poor children who handed them over to the evil capitalist at the time of the Industrial Revolution were not bad parents then, but like most parents everywhere who want the best for their children, they chose to do so because they preferred their children alive, even it was a miserable life, rather than dead. Contrary to still popular myths in leftist circles then, capitalism did not cause misery, but it literally saved the lives of countless millions of people from death by starvation and gradually lifted them up from their previous state of abject poverty and labor unions and governments and their so-called social policies did not help in this regard, but hampered and retarded this process of gradual economic improvement and were and still are responsible for countless numbers of unnecessary deaths. Now, there are many other related, equally or even more absurd myths propagated by to use Nicholas Taleb, Taleb's label, intellectuals yet idiots, um, 
and which are widely believed by the general public. For instance, that you can legislate greater economic prosperity by simply passing minimum wage laws. But why then not legislate hourly wages, wage rates of $100 or $1,000? And why then is India, for instance, still a poor country? Are the ruling elites in India, for instance, um, so stupid that they don't recognize that they have a magic formula to make the country rich? Um, or else, another myth, that economic misery can be overcome by simply increasing monetary spending. But why then, since everywhere nowadays governments can easily increase the quantity of paper money in practically unlimited amounts, why then is there still any poor person in the world around? Nor are that such faulty historical narratives restricted only to economic history. Rather, much of what we have learned as established truth from our standard history books about World War I and World War II, about the American and the French Revolution, about Hitler, Churchill, Roosevelt, Napoleon, and on and on and on, also turns out faulty history, that is, facts mixed in, whether intentional or unintentional, with hefty doses of fiction and fact, and fake. Now important, as a revision of all these myths is, however, whether economic or otherwise, the greatest challenge for libertarians is to develop a grand historical narrative that is to counter and correct the so-called Whig theory of history that all ruling elites everywhere and at all times have tried to sell to the public. That is the view that we live in the best of all times and that they, our rulers, are the ones that guarantee that this stays so and that the grand sweep of history, notwithstanding some ups and downs, has been one of more or less steady progress. This Whig theory of history, despite some setbacks, motivated in particular by the experiences of the two disastrous world wars during the first half of the 20th century, has again regained a predominant position in the public mind, as indicated by the success of such books as Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and The Last Men, or still more recently by Steven Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature and also his book Enlightenment Now. And I'll come back to that later on. According to the proponents of this theory, what makes the present age so great and qualifies it as the best of all times is a combination of two factors. For one, never before in human history have technology and the natural sciences reached as high a level of development and have the average material living standards been as high as today which appears essentially correct and which fact, without doubt, has much contributed to the public appeal and acceptance of the Whig theory. And secondly, never before in history have people supposedly experienced as much freedom as today with the development of liberal democracy or democratic capitalism which claim, despite its widespread popularity, I consider a historical myth. And since the degree of freedom and of economic and technological development are indeed positively correlated, leads me to the conclusion that average material living standards would have been even higher than they are presently 
if history only had taken a different course. But before offering an alternative grand revisionist historical narrative and indicating where Pinker and his ilk go off the rails with their Whiggish world history, a brief remark on the history of science is in order. Until relatively recently, the belief in a steady growth of science, if nothing else, has never been much in doubt until the early 1960s with the historian of science Thomas Kuhn and his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn, in contrast to the orthodox Whiggish view on the matter, portrayed the development of science not so much as a continuous march upward and into the light, but rather as a sequence of paradigm shifts that follow each other much like directionless, one lady fashion follows another. The book became a huge success and for quite some time Kuhn's views became itself a widespread fashion in philosophical circles. Kuhn notwithstanding, however, I still regard the traditional view concerning the development of science as essentially correct. The central error of Kuhn's as well as of many philosophers of science and revealingly also expressed again and again, for instance, by Sheldon Cooper, the super science nerd theoretical physicist character of the hugely popular TV series, The Big Bang Theory, their fundamental error lies in a misconception regarding the interrelationship between science on the one hand and engineering and technology on the other. This is the popular misconception of regarding science as coming before, having priority, and assuming a higher rank and dignity vis-a-vis -vis engineering and technology as only secondary and inferior intellectual enterprises as mere applied science. In fact, however, matters are exactly the other way around. What comes methodologically first and what makes science as we know it at all possible and at the same time provides the ultimate foundation is human engineering and construction. Put plainly and bluntly, without such purposefully designed and constructed instruments such as measuring rods, clocks, planes, rectangles, scales, counters, lenses, microscopes, telescopes, audiometers, thermometers, spectrometers, x-ray machines and ultrasound machines, particle accelerators, and so on and on, no empirical and experimental science as we know it would be possible. Or to put it in the word of the great late German philosopher scientist Peter Janich, handwerk, that is handiwork, comes before and provides the stable foundation and groundwork of Mundwerk, just talking. Um, whatever controversies or quibbles scientists may have then, they are always controversies and quibbles within a stable operational framework and reference system defined by a given state of technology. And in the field of human engineering, no one would ever throw out or falsify a working instrument until and unless he had another better working instrument available. Hence, it is engineering and advances in engineering that make science and scientific progress possible and at the same time prevent that from happening which Karl Popper's falsificationist philosophy of science that currently dominates intellectual public opinion must always as, admit as always possible. Not only scientific regression, but even the complete breakdown of our entire system of knowledge due to the supposedly 
always possible falsification of even its seemingly most basic hypothesis. What prevents this nightmare from happening and what exposes both Kuhn's relativism and Popper's related falsificationism as involving an elementary methodological error is the existence of handwerk, handwork, and its methodical priority and primacy over the mere mundwerk of science. Now with this out of the way, I can now turn to the fake part of the Whig theory of history, namely concerning social history. While it is comparatively easy to diagnose technological and along with this also scientific progress, namely progress occurs whenever we learn how to successfully accomplish some additional more and or quicker or better result in our purposeful dealings with the non-human world of material objects, plants, and animals. While this is comparatively easy, it is significantly more difficult to define and diagnose social progress. That is, progress in interpersonal dealings are man-to-man -man interactions. To do this, it is first necessary to define a model of social perfection that is in accordance with human nature, that is, of men as they really are which then can serve as a reference system to diagnose the relative proximity or distance of various historical events, periods, and developments to and from this ideal. And this definition of social perfection and social progress must be strictly separate, independent, and analytically distinct from the definition of technological and scientific growth and perfection. Even if both progress and growth dimensions are empirically positively correlated. Conceptually, that is, it must be allowed that there can be societies that are near perfect socially, but technologically backward, as well as societies that are technologically highly advanced and yet socially backward. For the libertarian, the ideal of social perfection is peace. That is, the normally and typically tranquil and frictionless person-to-person -person interaction and the peaceful resolution of occasional conflict within the stable framework of private or several mutually exclusive property and property rights. I do not want to appeal with this only to libertarians, however, but a potentially universal or Catholic audience, because the same ideal of social perfection is essentially also the one prescribed by the 10 biblical commandments. Here we are again Sunday as you have heard. Setting, as, setting the, four, the first four commandments aside, which refer to our relation to God as the one and only ultimate moral authority and final judge of our earthly conduct and the proper celebration of the Sabbath, the rest, referring to worldly affairs, display a deep and profoundly libertarian spirit. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother as the Lord our God has commanded you and that you um, uh, and your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, um, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. 
Now, some libertarians may, may argue that not all of these commandments have the same rank or status. They may point out, for instance, that the fifth and the seventh commandment are not on a par and of the same dignity as the commandments 6, 8, and 10. That this may also be the case with commandment 9, prohibiting libel. Or that desiring another's wife or servant is not on a par with coveting his house or field. However, the Ten Commandments do not say anything about the severity and suitable punishment of violations of its various commands. They proscribe all mentioned activities and desires, but they leave open the question of how severely any of them deserves to be punished. In this, the biblical commandments go above and beyond what many libertarians regard as sufficient for the establishment of a peaceful social order, namely the mere strict adherence to the commandments 6, 8, and 10. Yet this difference between a strict and a strict and rigid libertarianism and the Ten Biblical Commandments does not imply any incompatibility of the two. Both are in complete harmony if only a distinction is made between legal prohibitions on the one hand, expressed in the Commandments 6, 8, and 10, violations of which may be punished by the exercise of physical violence, and on the other hand, extra legal or moral prohibitions on the other hand, expressed in the commandments 5, 7, and 9, violations of which may be punished only by means below the threshold of physical violence, such as social disapproval, discrimination, exclusion, or ostracism. Instead, or indeed, if we interpret things in this way, the full six mentioned commandments can be recognized as even an improvement over the strict and rigid libertarianism, given the common shared goal of social perfection of a stable, just, and peaceful social order. For surely, any society of people who habitually disrespect their parents and routinely mock the idea of natural ranks and hierarchies of social authority, which underlies the institution of the family, who poo-poo the institution of marriage and cavalierly regard adultery as inconsequential, faultless, or even liberating acts, or who habitually scoff at the idea of personal honor and honesty, and routinely or even gleefully engage in libeling their neighbors, um, that is, practicing bearing false witness against your neighbor, any such society will quickly disintegrate into a group of people ceaselessly disturbed by social strife and conflict rather than enjoying enduring and lasting peace. Now, taking these biblical libertarian ideal of social perfection as a benchmark then, the next step in our argument must be the diagnosis, that is, the comparative evaluation and ranking of various historical periods and developments regarding their relative proximity or distance to this ultimate ideal goal. Now, in this regard, immediately a first diagnosis concerning the contemporary world impresses itself. Even if we may grant that the dominant Western model of liberal democracy or democratic capitalism comes closer to the ideal than the models of social organization presently followed elsewhere, outside the so-called Western world, even then, it still fails glaringly short of the ideal. Indeed, it explicitly and unequivocally contradicts and violates the Catholic biblical commandments and the proponents and promoters of this model then manifestly, even if not admittedly so, 
deny and oppose God's will and turn out advocates of the devil instead. For one, even with the greatest intellectual contortions, it is impossible to derive the institution of a state from these commandments. If no one may steal, murder, or desire another person's property, then no institution that may steal, murder, or desire another person's property can ever be permitted to come into existence. Yet as all other societies today, all present Western societies too, are societies with states, which may routinely steal, that is tax, may routinely murder, they go to war, and routinely covet other people's property through legislation. Moreover, in Western democratic state societies in particular, the moral sin of desiring another man's property is not only not strictly and universally outlawed, but routinely practiced, but under democracy, this sin is actually promoted and cultivated to its utmost devilish extreme. With democracy, with democratic elections installed as a centerpiece of social life, everyone is liberated from God's commandment and made free to desire whatever he wants of the property of others and to express his immoral desires through regular anonymous elections and votes. Surely, this liberal democratic model of social organization cannot be the end of history, neither for a libertarian nor anyone taking the biblical commandments to heart. Indeed, Fukuyama's claim to the contrary borders on the blasphemous. Regardless of how distasteful or disastrous the diagnosis of the con contemporary world turns out to be, however, it might be the case that the present state of affairs represents some sort of progress. It might not be the end of history, but it might be a closer approximation to the goal of social perfection than anything historically preceding it. To refute the Whig theory of history in its entirety then, it is further necessary to identify some earlier and thus naturally technologically less advanced society that adhered more closely to the biblical commandments and came nearer to social perfection. And so as to carry any weight in public debate, that is in the battle of rival historical narratives, the counterexample in question should be a big one. That is, it should not be some teeny place for only a short time span, but a large scale and long lasting historical phenomenon. And for the same reason of potential popular appeal, the example should be connected both geographically and genealogically as a historical predecessor to the contemporary Western model of democratic state societies. And it should not be too far in the dark history in a distant past. Now in my own attempts at offering a revisionist account of Western history, in particular in my two books, Democracy, the God That Failed, um, and uh, A Short History of Men, I have identified the European Middle Ages, or what is sometimes and also better referred to as Latin Christendom, as that is the roughly thousand year period from the fall of Rome until the late 16th or early 17th century, as such an example. Not perfect in many ways, but closer to the ideal of social perfection than anything that followed it, and in particular, the present democratic order. Not surprisingly, this is also the very period in Western history that our current godless democratic rulers and their court historians have chosen to portray in the darkest of terms. In Greek and Roman history, they can see some good and valuable, even it is supposedly lags far behind 
the level of social advancement reached with a contemporary democratic social order. But as for the Middle Ages, they are routinely portrayed as dark, cruel, and filled with superstition, best to be forgotten and ignored in all of standard history and historical narrative. Now, why is this most unfavorable treatment in particular of the Middle Ages? Because as many historians, old and contemporary, have of course noticed too, the Middle Ages represent a large scale and long lasting historical example of a stateless society as required by the commandments. And as such represent the polar opposite of the present statist social orders. Indeed, the Middle Ages, notwithstanding its many imperfections, can be identified as a God-pleasing or a Gottgefällige social order, whereas the present democratic order, notwithstanding its numeral achievements, stands in constant violation of God's commandments and must be identified as a satanic order. And to answer the question then, Satan and his earthly followers will of course go all out to make us ignore and forget about God and belittle, besmirch, and denigrate everything and anything that shows God's hand. The more reason then for any libertarian and God-pleasing Catholic to study and draw inspiration from the historical period of the European Middle Ages. Something incidentally made much easier nowadays and likely to encounter little opposition from the powers that be and their increasingly rigorously enforced speech code of political correctness because any such study has long since been relegated to the status of a nerdy, quaint, and exotic interest far distant in time from the present and without any contemporary relevance. In standard orthodox history, we are told as a quasi-axiomatic truth that the institution of a state, and that is the systematic violation of biblical commandments is necessary and indispensable for the maintenance of social peace. The study of the Middle Ages and Latin Christendom shows that this is untrue, an historical myth, and how, for a lengthy historical period, peace was successfully maintained without a state and thus without open renunciation of libertarian and biblical precepts. While many libertarians fancy an anarchic social order as a largely horizontal order without hierarchies and different ranks of authority as some sort of anti-authoritarian paradise, the medieval example of a stateless society teaches otherwise. Peace was not maintained by the absence of hierarchies and ranks of authority but by the absence of anything but social authority and social ranks of, of authority. Indeed, in contrast to the present order, which essentially recognizes only one authority, that of the state, the Middle Ages were characterized by a great multitude of competing, cooperating, and hierarchically ordered social hierarchies and ranks of authority. There was, the authority, that there was the authority of the heads of family households and of various kinship groups. There were patrons, lords, overlords, and feudal kings with their various estates, and then their vassals, and the vassals of vassals. There were countless different and separate communities and towns and a huge variety of religious, artistic, professional, and social orders, councils, assemblies, guilds, associations, and clubs, each with their own rules, hierarchies, and rank orders. In addition, and of utmost importance, there were the authorities of the local priest, the more distant bishop, and of the pope in Rome. But no authority was absolute. 
and no one or no group of people held a monopoly on its position or rank of authority. The hierarchical feudal lord vassal relationship, for instance, was not indissoluble. It could be broken if either side violated the provisions of the fealty oaths they both had sworn to uphold. Nor was a relationship between lord and vassal a transitive one. That is, the lord of a vassal was not on account of his lordship also the lord of all the vassal's vassals. Indeed, such vassals could be tied as vassals to a different lord, or they could elsewhere and regarding other things be a lord themselves that precluded any involvement in the affairs of the very lord in question. It was thus near impossible for anyone to exercise any straight top-down authority and hence made also immensely difficult in particular to raise and maintain a large standing army and engage in large scale or even continent wide war. That is the phenomenon which we have come to regard as perfectly normal today that a command is given from the top on down that is directly binding on all of society from its highest ranks down to the lowliest was completely absent in the Middle Ages. Authority was widely dispersed and any one person or position of authority was constrained and kept in check by another. Even feudal kings, bishops, and indeed even the Pope himself could be called upon and brought to justice by other competing authorities. Feudal law reflected this hierarchic, anarchic social structure of the Middle Ages. All of law was essentially private law. That is, law applying to persons and person-to-person -person interactions. All litigation was between a personal defendant and a personal plaintiff. And punishment typically involved the payment of some specified material compensation by the offender to the victim or his lawful successor. However, this central characteristic of the Middle Ages, and especially the earlier Middle Ages, as a historical model of a private law society did not mean that feudal law was some sort of unitary, coherent, and consistent legal system. To the contrary, feudal law allowed for a great variety of locally and regionally different laws and customs, and the difference in the treatment of similar offenses in different localities could be quite drastic. Yet at the same time, with the Catholic Church and the scholastic teachings of the natural law, there was an overarching institutional framework and moral reference system in place to serve as a morally unifying force, constraining and moderating the range of variation between the laws of different localities. Needless to say, there were many imperfections that future historians up to this day would focus on and highlight so as to discredit the entire period. During the Middle Ages, under the influence of the Catholic Church, the institution of slavery, which had been a dominant feature of Greek and Roman society, had been increasingly discredited and pushed back to near extinction but it had not entirely disappeared. As well, the institution of serfdom, from a moral point of view better than slavery, but still not without moral blemish, was still a widespread social phenomenon. Moreover, plenty of small scale wars and feuds took place during the entire period. And as we are never allowed to forget, the punishments dished out in various law courts for various offenses here or there were sometimes, at least for modern sensibilities, extreme, harsh, and cruel. 
A murderer might be hung or beheaded, quartered, burned, boiled or drowned. A thief might have his fingers or hand cut off. A false witness might his tongue torn out. An adulteress might be stoned, a rapist castrated, and a witch burned. It is these features in particular that we are told in standard history to associate with the Middle Ages so as to arouse our moral indignation and feel elated about our own enlightened present. Even if all true, however, any such exclusive concentration on these features as a distinctive characteristic of the Middle Ages is to miss the mark or the wood for the trees. It takes accidents for nature and what is natural and normal. That is, it ignores, whether deliberately or not, the central characteristic of the entire period, namely the fact that it was a stateless social order with widely dispersed, hierarchically ordered, and rivaling centers of authority. It then conveniently closes the eyes to the fact that the excesses of the Middle Ages actually pale in comparison to those of the present democratic state order. For surely, slavery and serfdom have not disappeared in the democratic world. Rather, some increasingly rare private slavery and serfdom have been replaced by a near universal system of public tax slavery and serfdom. As well, Wars have not disappeared, but only become of a larger scale. And as for the excessive punishments and witch hunts, they have not gone away either. To the contrary, they have multiplied. Enemies of the state are tortured in the same old gruesome or even technically refined ways as in the old days. Moreover, countless people who are not a murderer not a thief, not a libeler, not an adulterer, not a rapist. That is, people who live in complete accordance with the Ten Commandments and once would have been left alone are nonetheless routinely punished today, up to the level of lengthy incarceration or the loss of all of their property. Witches are no longer called that way. But with just one single authority in place, the identification of anyone as a suspect of evil doing or a troublemaker is greatly facilitated and the number of people so identified has accordingly multiplied. And while such suspects are no longer burned at the stake, they are routinely punished by up to lifelong economic deprivation, unemployment, poverty, or even starvation. And while once, during the Middle Ages, the primary purpose of punishment was restitution, that is, the offender had to compensate the victim, the primary purpose of punishment today is submission. That is, the offender must compensate and satisfy, first of all, not the victim, but the state, thus being victimized twice. With this, I can state a first conclusion. The present democratic order may be the technologically most advanced civilization, but it most certainly is not the socially most advanced society. As measured by biblical libertarian standards of social perfection, it falls far behind the Middle Ages. Indeed, as measured by these standards, the transition in European history from the anarchic medieval to the modern statist world is nothing less than the transition from a God-pleasing to a godless social order. At various places, in the most condensed form in my essay from aristocracy to monarchy to democracy, I have analyzed and tried to reconstruct this process of decivilization, which has by now been going on for half a millennium, and to explain the calamitous and deleterious consequences and ramifications 
that is had, had for the development of law and economics. I shall not repeat or recapitulate any of this here. Rather, I only want to shed some light on the principal strategy that all statists from the late Middle Ages on until today have pursued to reach their statist ends. So as to also gain, if only indirectly, some insight into any possible counter strategy that could lead us out of the current predicament. Not back to the Middle Ages, of course, because too many permanent and irreversible changes have taken place since, both in regard to our mental and our material conditions and capacities. But to a new society that takes the cues from the study of the Middle Ages and understands and knows of the principal reason for its demise. The strategy was dictated by the quasi-libertarian, quasi stateless, medieval starting point. And it suggested itself naturally first and foremost to the top ranks of social authority, that is, in particular, to feudal kings. In a nutshell, it boils down to this rule. Instead of remaining a mere primus inter pares, you must become the solos primus. Um, and to do this, you must undermine, weaken, and ultimately eliminate all competing social authorities and hierarchies of authority. Beginning at the highest level of authority, with your most immediate competitors, and from there on down ultimately to the most elementary and decentralized level of social authority invested in the heads of individual family households, you, every statist, must use your own initial authority to undermine each and every rival authority and strip away its right to independently judge, discriminate, sentence and punish within its own territorially limited realm of authority. Kings, other than you, must no longer be allowed to freely determine who is another or the next king, who is to be included or excluded from the rank of kings, or who may or may not become before them for justice and assistance and likewise for all other levels of social authority, for noble lords and vassals, as well as all separate local communities, orders, associations, and ultimately all individual family households. No one of them must be free to autonomously determine its own rules of admission and exclusion. That is, to determine who is in or who is out what conducts to expect of those who are in, and what to remain in good standing, and what membership conduct instead results in various sanctions, ranging from disapproval, censure, and fines to expulsion and corporal punishment. And how to accomplish this and centralize and consolidate all authority in the hands of a single territorial monopolist, first an absolute monarch and subsequently a democratic state? Answer, by enlisting the support of everyone resentful of not having been included or promoted in some particular community, association, or social rank, or for being expelled from them and unfairly punished. Against this unfair discrimination, you, the state, or would-be state, promise the excluded victim to get them in and help them get a fair and non-discriminating treatment in return for their binding commitment and affiliation with you. On every level of social authority, whenever and wherever the opportunity arises, you encourage and promote deviant behavior and deviance and enlist their help and support in order to expand and strengthen your own authority at the expense of all others. Accordingly then, 
the principal counter strategy of re-civilization then must be a return to normality by means of decentralization. The process of territorial expansion that went hand in hand with the centralization of all authority in one monopolistic hand must be reversed. Each and every secessionist tendency and movement then should be supported and promoted because with every territorial separation from the central state is simultaneously another separate and rival center of authority and judication created. And the same tendency should be promoted within the framework of any newly created separate and independent territory and center of authority. That is, any voluntary membership organization, association, order, club, or even household within the new territory, territory should be free to independently determine its own house rules. That is, the rules of inclusion, of sanctions, and of exclusion, so as to successively replace the current status system of forced territorial and legal integration and uniformation with a natural quasi-organic social order of, voluntarily, of voluntary territorial and legal customary association and disassociation. 